Hi, I'm Nicole Mercadich. I'm the author of Bent at the Spine. Actually, starting with the title is a great way into my sense of poetics, I believe, because I love the idea of language and the body and the way writing references the body so often, but in ways that either tricks us into thinking it's about something else or reminds us about the bodies, but in a different way. So, for example, you know, poems have feet and lines can be enjammed. In my section, Widows and Orphans, which refers to human emotional state of being, is also a way of describing typographical terms. So I'm interested in the way these things lap and overlap and sort of bump up against each other. And in Bent at the Spine, as soon as you say a book has a bent spine, you're implying that it's well read, that it's been previously enjoyed, as they say in the car dealerships, that it's part of your, you know, part of your library that's been opened and bent, bent up. But bent also references human state of beings, you know, certain, certain ways of being an activist in the world or being ignored by the world or marginalized by the world. And when you think of a bent spine, it's either a spine that's bent over in agony or bent over in pleasure, doing a somersault or yoga or, you know, lying in a funny position because that relieves your sore neck or something. So I'm, I'm very interested in the connections between disability and the idea of normal and the way language constructs us and like I say, pleasure, and the, the way the body gives us pleasure, but also creates, creates a way for us to talk about the world through our own you know, corporeal experience of it. Well, a week ago, Poets and Profile asked me what the inspiration for my first poem was, my first long poem, and I said, visiting the dump, which was completely frivolous answer, but kind of pertinent because I was writing a poem about getting dumped and I thought it was important to go visit the dump, <laughs> do my research. But it's also like the way I immerse myself in the world or the way I write about poetry is to try to immerse myself in the world or be aware of how we're all immersed in the world. And we live in a world right now that's commercial and sexist and racially oppressive and ableist and religiously tangled and a world that discards far too much and far too easily. So I want to write about all of those important things, but I also want to write about pleasure and the joy of sound and language. I don't just want to write an essay or hit someone over the head with an argument. I, I want to get into the words on the page. And so if you're writing about getting dumped, the, the word dump is in there. So what is it about discarding? What is it about, you know, refuse that that might inform the poem? So I think that in a way I take I take all the rubble of dynamic language and I try to make a poem out of it. Often I begin with one word. Like for example, last week I was riding the subway and I heard a guy say he was overwhelmed at work. And I thought of the way a lot of people use, you know, a play on that word to say, for example, oh, she was underwhelmed by her boyfriend's apology. And then it starts making me think about, okay, then what does whelm mean? Can you be whelmed by something? And is it that perfect neutral word, like right between overwhelmed and underwhelmed? And whelmed actually means overwhelmed. Like, so then I start thinking, well, then should we start saying, I'm over overwhelmed you know, for emphasis? Or, you know, what happens to that word? And even just writing the word whelm on the page makes the reader think about language in a different way because that's not the way they're expecting to see that word. And then as soon as I see the word whelm on the page, I want to write the word helm. And then I go into whole homolinguistic play and run off and I write something like this, which I wrote in the last week. Whelming utters while trying to steady the helm, wearing the help meets helmet while uttering hemmed in vows, LMO, wham. Now, now that's just, you know, a draft I've worked on this week. So my real process 
because all I've talked about is one word so far, but my real, real process is to do 10,000 drafts, you know, to edit and rewrite and edit and rewrite and edit and rewrite. So that's my process. anyone who's reading it? And I know that's a really frivolous answer, but I'm serious. Anyone who wants to read this book is my ideal reader. Anyone who picks this book up and thinks this is the kind of poetry I'm interested in is who I'm aiming at. Like I don't have an idea of a certain kind of poetics or a, even a certain kind of poet, but if people want this kind of poetry, then I want them. I was so happy when Michael Davidson did the blurb for the back of the book because he's he's someone who's in both my world, like the poetry world that I'm interested in, the disjunctive poetics, and he's very interested in disability theory and language and history and, <clears throat> and activism. And for me, you know, this book isn't about disability any more than it's about, you know, language or typography or overheard references on the subway, but that stuff informs my poetics. So one of the things that Davidson's interested in, that I'm interested in, is the idea of the normal body. What is, an I what is a normal body, and then what is an abnormal body? And so much of our daily metaphors are invested in the idea of the ideal body that I want to bring that to the front. I want to remind people that First of all, there is no such thing as an ideal body, but also that we, we act as if there is, we act as if that's possible, as if you know, normal and ideal and perfect are things we not only could strive for, but should strive for. So I want to question those notions we have about the body and the language surrounding the body. Critic Peter Quartermain has written this book on 20th century poetics called disjunctive poetics. I read the entire book looking for a definition of that <laughs> phrase, and it's not in there, so I argue with him about that quite a bit. But to me, it's, it's a very interesting and useful term. I, it's, it's one of those throwaway terms where everything is disjunctive verse, but, or disjunctive poetics, which is more how I think of it. But to me, it's very useful because I start thinking, okay, what would conjunctive verse be? You know, like conjunctivitis is some sort of illness, but Conjunctive verse would be a joining up, putting together. And conjunctive verse is what I think of as, you know, companion or opposite to disjunctive. But disjunctive isn't necessarily a taking apart. It can be, but it's often a way of putting things beside each other in a way that doesn't fit or doesn't fit nicely. So for the reader, if, if they come to disjunctive verse, it seems to me that it's their job to take it apart or rearrange it or take it in this completely awkward and new conjoinment. So I'm, I'm interested in the connections that a reader makes when they, you know, when they come across the disjunctions. Adjectives and adverbs. Seven monks with European accents kneel blessedly on the even stone, weep regularly beside the last corner, sigh. Protect the vital months. Pause gaily at the beginning of the second page. Wait for a new pronoun in the mirror-tricked corridor. Include the bent people who only bend their knees one at a time. Rule the bee multitudes who lap at honeycombs, who lap buzzingly at combed honey. A buzzing indicates commas that are beginning or ending. No way to reach the body in time. Adversaries and objectives. Seventeen souls march away from the hellmouth, the hell tongue, hell's retainer. March blithely, march determinedly, march madness. Soul or spirit, sprite or sprang. Protein is vital. Be sure to remember more than languidly, more than up umpteen times, more swiftly than a border mammoth. Inches from the edge, I reward you gorgeously, colossally, gargantuously. A, B, C, weighty matters matter. Call at the final end or the momentous finale. Nobody reaches the end without great undue suffering. Paying one's dues, finally, on time, surprisingly, Lee. <laughs>